Today's scripture reading is Luke 19, 45 to 20, 19. And this we're reading from the clear word. Then he urged the donkey forward, and the procession moved on into the city with the people shouting and chanting until they reached the temple. There Jesus stopped, got off the donkey, and went inside. He ordered those who bought and sold animals at huge profits to get out. He said to them, it is written in the scriptures, my house is a house for prayer, but you have turned it into a gathering place for thieves. The next few days, Jesus taught openly in the temple, and the chief priests, the teachers, and the leaders determined to have him arrested and taken to Pilate to be executed. But because the people were taking in every word he was saying, and because many of them were being healed, the leaders found it difficult to have Jesus arrested. One day during his last week in Jerusalem, as Jesus was teaching in the temple, sharing the good news of salvation with the people, the chief priests, the teachers, and the elders came and said to him, we have a question. By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered, let me also ask you a question. Then I'll give you my answer. Did God give John the Baptist the authority to do what he did, or did he get his authority from someone else? They went into a huddle and discussed among themselves what answer to give. Finally, they said to each other, if we say that John got his authority from God, he'll say, then why didn't you believe what he preached? And if we say that he got his authority from someone else, we'll be in trouble with the people because they believe that John was a prophet. So they went back to Jesus and said, we can't answer your question because we don't know who authorized him to do what he did. And Jesus said, if that's the case, I don't need to tell you by what authority I do what I'm doing. Then he turned to the people and told them a parable. A man owned a large vineyard. He decided to lease it out to some vineyard keepers to watch over and tend. Then he left for a distant country on business and was gone for some time. At the end of the first season, he sent one of his account managers to collect the profits from the harvest. But the vineyard keepers beat up the manager and sent him away empty handed. So the owner sent another account manager to see them and they also beat him up, mistreated him and sent him away empty handed. The owner sent a third account manager to see the tenants, and they did the same thing to him and threw him out of the vineyard, battered and bruised. Then the vineyard owner said to himself, I know what I'll do. I'll send my only son, whom I love very much, because when they meet him, they can't help but love and respect him. But when the vineyard keepers saw the son coming, they said, this is the heir to the old man's property. Let's kill him. Then we can claim the vineyard as ours. So they grabbed him, took him outside the gate and killed him. What do you think the vineyard owners will do to those men? I'll tell you what he'll do. He'll come and destroy the whole lot of them and find some new vineyard keepers whom he can trust. When the chief priests, the teachers, and the elders heard this, they quickly caught the meaning of the parable and said, this would never happen to us. Jesus looked at them and said, tell me, what does the scripture mean when it says, the stone that the builders first rejected as worthless eventually was seen to be the very one needed to hold up the temple. That stone represents the Messiah. Whoever falls on this stone will have his heart broken, but those who reject this stone will someday see it coming toward them, and it will fall on them and crush them. The chief priests, the teachers, and the elders knew that Jesus was talking about them and wished they could get their hands on him, but they were afraid to do so in front of the people. 
May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. My heart is full. The songs today, they tell the story. The message is all there. Beautiful life with such a friend. Jesus, beautiful life with such a friend. And Kat and Hadassah, that song, he wants it all. It's so true. Jesus does want it all. He wants our lives. He wants us to give him everything and to trust him with everything because it is a beautiful life with such a friend. As we open God's word, let's pray. The Holy Spirit is here with us to move on our hearts. Oh, Spirit of the living God, our Father, Jesus, our brother, our friend, thank you for your word. And thank you for your great love and power that is here with us today, present in your church, present in your word as it is proclaimed. Jesus, please speak. Speak to our hearts. Call us to yourself. Call us to lay aside our bankrupt lives and to let you have it all. In your name we ask, amen. So when we look at these stories in Luke, these are difficult, harsh stories. We see Jesus coming into the temple, and Luke tells it in a very succinct way as he comes into the temple and casts out the the money changers and the people who were doing business in the temple courts. This is the second time, actually, that Jesus has gone into the temple and cleansed it. The first time the Gospel of John tells us, came near the beginning of his ministry. And now here he's in the final week of his ministry, cleansing the temple again. I want you to imagine the scene. Imagine that you're there on that day in the temple. What does it look like as Jesus enters the temple and cleanses it? He has ridden into the city on a donkey. The crowds have acclaimed him as Messiah. And now he enters into a very busy, busy, busy place. There's lots of noise and commotion. And this stuff goes on every day. This is the ordinary way of things in the temple. People changing money. So you couldn't use ordinary money in the temple. You had to use special temple money. People who had traveled needed to purchase a sacrifice to offer at the temple. So there's this huge business going on, hubbub, and Jesus... One man, one man enters the temple courts. As far as we know, he hasn't coordinated this. He hasn't announced to his disciples, help me out. Here's the plan. You come in this, I'm coming in here. Here's how we're going to tackle everybody. One man, Jesus enters the temple. What, What are you picturing? How does one man enter a very busy, crowded, noisy space and cast everyone out? Are you getting the picture? This is not Jesus shy, quiet in the corner. This is Jesus very large and in charge and in command of the situation. There is something going on here where Jesus, this is no ordinary man who has entered the temple this day. Jesus enters with authority and it is evident to everyone that he has authority. The rulers later ask him, they're not disputing the fact that he has authority. They know he's got authority. They've witnessed it time and again throughout his life. Their question, which is really a trap that they're hoping to set for him, is where does your authority come? Please tell us, tell us, where do you get this authority from? But no one disputes that Jesus has authority. He comes in to the temple and that temple court is changed by the presence of Jesus. No longer business as usual. Back up with me to the Old Testament. A story that happened in the temple. We find it in what would have been the last book of the Hebrew Bible. 
It's not the last book of our Bible, but in the Hebrew Scriptures, it's the last. Out of all the books, it's 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 24. And it tells the story of a king and a prophet who is a priest's son. And I've just got to warn you that if you, like me, grew up loving Bible stories, I am about to destroy a beautiful story. Because one of my favorite stories as a little kid was the story of good King Joash. Joash. What was so cool about the Joash story is that he was a little kid when he becomes king. He's like seven years old. And in the Bible storybook, you know, I would picture little Joash sitting on the throne with his legs dangling and he can't even touch the ground, you know, this little tiny king. And he was such a good king because his uncle was the priest, good priest Jehoiada. And Jehoiada helped preserve Joash's life. This kid grew up under threat of his life. Joash trained him to love God and to love God's law. And so when he's seven years old, the day comes and they crown Joash king. And he's protected by the, by the priests. The, the temple guards protect the king. Because the queen, the wicked queen, Joash's grandmother, I guess, who doesn't want any usurpers, she comes raging into the court and she's shouting, treason, treason, how can this be? I'm the one with the power. But the priests have arranged for Joash, the rightful king, to take the throne. And it turns out that he's a good king, this little kid, because he's, he's trusting his uncle to guide him. And the temple is in bad repair. It's been neglected. God's people, who were supposed to love the temple and love God... They've turned their backs on the temple. And Joash, under the guidance of his uncle, sets up a little treasury chest. They're like, how are we going to fix up the temple? We need money. And so they set up this offering collection place. And as people come and go, they can drop their coins into this chest. You guys know this story? It's a great story, great kid story about the Bible, this good king. And the money fills up in the chest and they use it to repair the temple, and all is wonderful. And that's where the kid's version of the story ends. And I gotta tell you the rest of the story today. Sorry. The good priest Jehoiada dies. Old, he lives a long life, does a lot of good in his life. But he dies, and when he dies, the elders in the land see the opportunity to come and present themselves to the king. And they convince the king to go a different direction. And the very king who restored the temple, now, in order to please the elders of the people, he turns his back on the temple. And the whole nation turns its back on the temple. And they begin to worship other gods. And God sends prophets to them to warn them and to call them back to God. But they disregard the prophets. And then one day, a prophet by the name of Zechariah stands up to the king. Zechariah happens to be a descendant, maybe the son or the grandson, of Jehoiada. So here's Jehoiada the priest, the one who preserved Joash's life. And now it's his son or his grandson, Zechariah, who appears before the king and boldly denounces the king and says, what you are doing is wrong. You need to turn back to God. And King Joash, now all grown up, orders that Zechariah be killed. And they kill him in the courtyard of the temple itself. A prophet of God calling the people of God back to God and they kill him in the place of worship. Why? 
for the Jewish people, with the Hebrew Bible structured as it is, this is the last prophet to be killed in the Old Testament. And so when Jesus stands in the temple on this day and teaches the people and tells a parable of a vineyard owner sending his representatives to collect the fruits of his vineyard. And he tells a story of how the servants of the owner have been mistreated cast away, sent away empty-handed, and ultimately the heir has now come. This is the history on which he's drawing, and the history that would have been in the minds of the people. Let's talk about the reality of God's purpose for Israel because God's purpose for Israel is the same purpose that he has for all human beings. Why did God set apart this nation? Because he's, he's talking to the leaders of a nation. He's talking in the temple to a people who had lost sight of God's purpose. Right? The temple, Jesus says, my house is to be a house of prayer, and you have turned it into a den of thieves. I have a purpose here. There is a purpose for this place. There is a purpose for this nation. There is a purpose for people, how they're supposed to live, and yet you're not living that way. So what is the purpose? Some of you in the adult Sabbath school lesson right now, are studying through the book of Genesis. Studying about Abraham, the father of faith, the father of Israel. When God called Abram, before he was named Abraham, what was that call? I will bless you and make your name great and you will be a blessing. You will be a blessing. Through you, all families of the earth will be blessed. We're beginning to understand God's purpose for Israel and for all human beings. God's intention for you and for me and for all people is that we would be blessed in order to be a blessing. This is how God operates. This is how he calls us to live because this is, this is the only way to live. Blessed in order to be a blessing. Why is this the way we're supposed to live? It's because we are made in the image of God himself. How does God live? God, did you realize that God does not need anything? God does not need anything. God has existed from eternity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in a perfect unity of love. God does not need somebody to love him. He's got so much love being shared and exchanged between the members of the Godhead. He overflows with love. God doesn't need us to love him, to make him feel good about himself. Seriously, is your picture of God that he's up there in heaven? Kind of, and he has some down days and he's moping around like, those people just don't love me. Oh, what am I going to do? I need somebody to encourage me and lift me up. Is that your picture of God? No, there is never a moment in time when that's how God is behaving. God is ever complete and full and overflowing with love. And we're made in his image. We are made in the image of God, made to receive and give love, to live in love, to overflow in love. This is the legacy passed down to you and to me. This is who we are. We are made for love, made to overflow with love. That's life. Beautiful life with such a friend. It's the 
the purpose of life. Jesus uses here the image of a vineyard. A vineyard. So God has given us a vineyard. God gave Israel a vineyard. And this was a well-known image. You find it throughout the Bible. Israel is this vine. Israel is my vineyard, God says. But what happens with human beings? What do we do as God gives us a vineyard, gives us a space to use, to live life for his glory, to live life in love, to live life unselfishly, as a blessing to others. See, this is the good life that God gives to us. Unselfish life to live as a blessing for others. We get the idea that this life belongs to us. That this vineyard, nice vineyard, I'll take it. And we begin to think of our life and the stuff around us and our church as ours. We begin to appropriate to ourselves the blessings, and rather than seeing ourselves as conduits of blessing, you know, love needs to flow somewhere. When, you, when you've got love poured upon you, it's got to flow out, and you're going to be loving people. When you know that God loves you, you will love other people. When you're loved, you love. You love. But we forget that it's about love. And we begin to think that it's all about mine, 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 my stuff. My stuff to control. My life. My vineyard. My temple. And now I'm going to use this temple in this place to enrich myself. And that's what's going on on the day Jesus cleanses the temple. Here is a place of worship, a place for people to connect with God. There should be no barriers to the connection of God in the temple. When Jesus, he's quoting from Isaiah, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people, for all nations. That's the complete quote. All nations. All, this should be a place where no one is excluded Everybody has access to God. No barriers. And yet what have the people in charge done with this? Give them a temple, give them a vineyard, and they're looking for ways to enrich themselves. Jesus says you've made it into a den of robbers. What does he mean? Well, what was going on as we put the pieces together is that people couldn't use ordinary money in the temple. They had to use the temple money. And so whoever's in charge of the exchange rate gets to decide how much profit they're going to make. And they're ripping off people who are coming to worship. And the poor especially suffer from this as they come to purchase a sacrifice to make out of their poverty, wanting to have access to God and to worship and these wealthy, powerful people who run the temple are charging outrageous sums in exchange so that people can worship. So that people can worship. And they've completely lost the point of what the temple is for and what the nation is for and who God is. And they think it's all about us and our power and our wealth. Surely, surely people would not behave in such a way. And even the people who are behaving in such a way at the end of the parable, they say, God forbid, how could this be? And yet the reality is they had done it. And friends, whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, I'm, I'm calling on you to be honest with yourself as you look over your life as you think about how you go through your week, how do you wake up in the morning? How do you wake up in the morning? Is the thought when you roll out of bed, I get to work for God today. I get, I get to walk through life with Jesus, my friend, and he's the one calling the shots. Is that how you roll out of bed? Because if you do, I can guarantee you this, you're going to roll out of bed happy. 
But the reality is that many of us roll out of bed in the morning and we think, oh, it's up to me again. My plans. And maybe your plans are going well, in which case you're excited to get up and you're like, I'm going to go out and conquer the world. Yeah. But not every day is like that, is it? Some of you have been rolling out of bed for the last several weeks or months or however long, and you're like, I don't know if I can face another day doing life like this, doing life on my own, because it's all up to me to manage this. Do you see what's motivating the Jewish religious leaders in these stories? They like... They're wanting to kill Jesus, but they're held back, and they're like, we can't quite accomplish what we want. Why? They're afraid. They're motivated by fear. What is the emotion that you feel when you wake up in the morning? When you face going to work in the morning, or school, or when you face your family, or or just face going out the door? What are the emotions that you are feeling? Are you feeling peace and joy, or are you afraid? I'm just asking you to be honest with yourself. Because if you are feeling fear, you're not living right. Because God's intention for your life is that you would know that the vineyard doesn't belong to you. That you just get to work in the vineyard. You have the privilege of working in the vineyard for an amazing, amazing, amazing owner. When you wake up in the morning and you remember who this owner is, it's not mine. It's not up to me. I don't have to feel all this pressure on me to, to succeed and make it happen. The owner of the universe is the one who owns my life. And he loves me. Would that change the way you go out your day and your week? If you believe that? If you started every day like that? Yes, it would. Yes, it would. You would find yourself rolling out of bed and you'd be like, and you might have to have the conversation with yourself each morning. Is this my vineyard or is this God's vineyard? Oh yeah, God's, okay. Let me remember, this is God's vineyard. I don't have to feel this crazy pressure anymore. I get to go out here and work with God today. Once you remind yourself of that, you get going on your day. You don't need a cup of coffee to get you going. You got God. You got the Holy Spirit right there, breathing life into you, giving you excitement. You're ready to go. Now let's talk about this God. Let's talk about who Jesus is because I mentioned that Jesus comes into this temple with authority. He comes in with authority. Now he won't tell them where the authority comes from, but it's pretty obvious. This authority comes from God. This authority comes from God. Did you realize that Jesus gives Christians the same authority that he has? He says, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. All authority has been given to me, Jesus says. Therefore, I'm commissioning you. You've been given the authority of Jesus. See, here's how we, again, go through our lives far too often. And here's how we pray. (laughs) Oh, can't believe I'm stuck in this dead-end job. Can't stand my boss. If, if, if I have to put up with these coworkers and the way they talk trash about each other, one more day, oh God, please get me out of this place. What's the reality? What is the reality? Why, why would God answer that prayer? God's not going to answer that prayer. You asking to be taken out of a situation where God has placed you in order to enter in with the authority of Christ and be a blessing? Are you kidding me? God has called you to that place. So you've got a bunch of people who need to meet Jesus. Praise the Lord. That's why you're there. God has put you there to shine. 
Or what happens when you walk into a church? And this happens. You walk into a church and nobody's friendly. What a cold, dreary place this church is. Well, you can complain about it, but what good is that going to do you? God put you there that day. What are you going to do? Turn that into a place of joy because you have the authority of Jesus. You have entered the court. And it doesn't matter what's going on there. People changing money, people misbehaving, people doing stuff that disregards God. What are you going to do? You're not a victim of circumstances. Jesus is not a victim of circumstances. When he walks into a situation, oh, the temple, oh, what a terrible day at the temple. Oh, I'm so depressed. Let's go back outside of the city. Is that how Jesus responds? Jesus comes in and he sees what's happening and it's not right. And he says, we're making some changes around here. Now, I'm not telling you, and I don't think the Holy Spirit is necessarily telling you that you need to go to your workplaces next week and start throwing some tables over. I mean, who knows, maybe, but probably not that aggressive right from the get-go, right? But what I am saying, what Jesus is saying, is that you are not a victim of your circumstances. When you walk into a situation that is not what God wants it to be, don't complain about it. Don't moan to God about it. Oh, get me out of here. God has placed you there for a reason to make a difference. And he's given you authority. He's given you the joy of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the love of Jesus to enter that situation and make a difference. Amen. And we can do that because the cornerstone of the building is with us. See, Jesus uses this unusual quote at the end of the parable here. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. What is that talking about? You know, Peter, if you want to do a little interesting um, Bible study this afternoon, look at what Peter says about the cornerstone, because Peter pulls together just about all of the Old Testament references to the cornerstone, and he says they're all talking about Jesus. This is the stone that was rejected. This is the stone that people stumble over, and it has become the chief cornerstone. What is that talking about? Now we get some insight into this. In Desire of Ages, Ellen White talks about what happened when the temple was first being constructed, Solomon's temple. If, if you remember the story, Solomon's temple was this magnificent building and the sound of a hammer, chisel, whatever, was not heard on the construction site. Like they, they hewed, is that the word? They hewed out these rocks out, out of the quarry and they transported them to the temple site and everything just fit together in quiet and peace. Incredible. But apparently what happened in the construction of the temple is there's this huge rock that gets brought from the quarry and it's sitting there in the middle of the construction site and nobody knows what it is or what to do with it. It's just this big old ugly rock and it's in the way. And they're trying to figure out what are we going to do and move around it. And, and we need to get it out of the way so we can build. But as they're seeking to lay the lines for the temple, they're struggling to find a suitable cornerstone. The cornerstone at the corner of the building where the walls line up. The cornerstone where the weight of the building rests. And they try several different stones and they can't find one that works. These stones are all too weak. Cornerstone's got to be strong. It's got to be something that can withstand the pressure that wind and rain and sun and the weight of the building year after year is not going to make it crack. They're looking for rocks that'll suit the purposes and they can't find one until finally somebody realizes, oh, this big old annoying rock that we've been stumbling over. This is the cornerstone. Look at it. It's out here. It's been in the sun. It's been in the weather, sitting there in the way. We've been tripping over it all this time and not a single crack in it. This thing is solid. This is the rock we want as the cornerstone. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. 
And Jesus is saying, that's me. I'm the one that people rejected. I'm the one that people didn't want because people thought, I'm going to live life on my own. I'm going to do life my way. And yet their lives are crumbling. How is life going on your own? How are you doing at managing on your own? How's your anxiety level? Friends, you do not have to live with anxiety. You do not have to live with discouragement. A Christian with discouragement is not living as a Christian should live. You don't have to. You do not have to live with discouragement. Because you have a cornerstone who doesn't crack when the going gets rough. You have a cornerstone who can withstand the pressure. The weight of your entire life can come down upon that cornerstone. And as Jesus says, you will break, but that cornerstone's not going to break. Let yourself be broken in the good way by falling on the cornerstone. Let your hard shell of pretense you thinking you've got to be tough and face the world on your own, let that hard shell be broken as you fall upon Jesus and realize how strong and capable he is. Because he's going to hold you up. This is not just theoretical, friends. This is real. Like you get up in the morning and you start your day talking to God and you will discover that he is more than capable of sustaining your life. Like the problems that are overwhelming you when you wake up, that, that make you think, I cannot, I cannot face this day. You do not have to carry that burden. You do not have to deal with that discouragement. Talk to your heavenly father. Talk to Jesus, the cornerstone. Let him carry those burdens. He will. You're going to hear him whispering to you in the morning. You're going to hear him whispering in the secret places you meet with him. I love you, my child. I'm going to carry you through this. You do not have to be afraid. It's so good. He is so good. Jesus will do this for you. Even now right here, right now. Some of us are carrying some pretty heavy stuff, some heavy stuff. Some of us have been trying to run our lives. We're, we're, we're clinging to the shreds of a life that we're seeking to control and manage. And God is saying to us, I want it all. Just like the song, I want it all because I will take the pieces of you, your life, and I'm going to make something beautiful out of it. Will you trust him? Will you trust him? I hope you will. Let's pray. Father and Jesus, our Savior. Jesus, the rejected cornerstone. Oh, don't, don't let us reject you, Jesus. Not a single person here looking at that cornerstone and saying, nope, I'm going to build my, my life on my own. Oh, Jesus. No, no, no. You are the cornerstone, the one who can withstand the pressures of life. You are the one who can hold us up. Help us to trust you. Help us to lean on you. You are the foundation of life. Help us to see that and to live that. Thank you. Amen.